Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is Hal Brands. I'm a senior fellow in the Foreign and Defense Policy Program here. I'm also a professor down the street at Johns Hopkins University, and it's my pleasure to host our discussion with Senator John Cornyn on American military readiness in a dangerous world. Uh, just to get things started a little bit, I think this couldn't possibly be a timelier subject. If you look around the world today, uh, Europe is experiencing its largest conflict since World War II in Ukraine. Uh, on the other side of the world, in the Western Pacific, uh, countries from South Korea to Japan to Australia are grappling with the implications of China's ongoing and really astonishing military buildup as fears of conflict in the region rise. At the same time, uh, the United States and other countries are engaged in something of a slow motion nuclear crisis with Iran, North Korea continually finds ways of reminding us of its capacity to make trouble. And of course, the problem of terrorism hasn't gone away, even if it seems to have subsided uh, a bit. We've also reached a pivotal point in our national debate uh, over defense. Uh, the United States, for a decade or so, has had trouble passing budgets on time, which eats away at the funds available to defense. There are significant debates ongoing now within the government and in the public sphere about what type of conflicts uh, of what nature and with whom the United States should be preparing for. And the choices that the United States makes in the coming years on defense will shape its ability to compete and to stabilize the international order for years and perhaps decades to come. Uh, and we couldn't have a better guest than Senator Cornyn to help us make sense of these issues uh, today. Uh, the Senator has been uh, a member of the Senate since 2002, representing uh, my home state of, of Texas. Uh, he's distinguished himself on the Select Committee on Intelligence, as well as on the Senate Finance and Judiciary Committees, and he's been a thought leader and really put himself at the center of a number of debates on national security, on everything from semiconductor issues uh, to military assistance for Ukraine to how the United States should think about uh, its competition and the prospect of, of conflict uh, with China. I won't read you his entire bio because it's, it's quite lengthy and, and substantial, but I hope you'll take my word for it in saying that, that he really is an authority on these subjects and, and we're very privileged to have him here today. So welcome, Senator. Thanks, Hal. So I want to start uh, off our discussion with kind of a, a broad question. Uh, and so maybe you could just reflect a little bit on you know, what is the state of the US military today relative to the challenges that the country faces? Is it adequate? Is it inadequate? How should we think about this problem? Well, for the last 20 years, um, we've been focused on the global war on terror, and um, which is a very, diff very different sort of readiness posture than great power competition, which we find ourselves in today. So we are, um, we're in a period of significant transition. When uh, President Obama talked about pivoting toward Asia, um, that sounded pretty good, but it really didn't manifest itself in a lot of, um, a lot of commitment there. Uh, one of the things I do think that uh, President Obama was right about is a Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm -hmm. In my recent trip to Japan with Senator Haggerty and Senator Cardin, um, every government official in, in Japan brought up the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So if we're not there involved in, in, the, in making the rules, working with our allies, then we know who will be, which is the PRC. But um, obviously we're financing uh, our military as a, as a matter of an, at least annual discussion. And um, as I mentioned to you, one of the things that concerns me the most is is a failure to really have a meaningful conversation about what the, th the, threat, the threats look like and what the posture we need to uh, take as opposed to what the top line of spending is. That seems to be the debate every time we talk about defense appropriations or an omnibus appropriation bill. Do we have parity with, with the non-defense discretionary? Um, I'd rather we live in a world where we figure out what, our, what the threats are, what our strategy is to deal with them, as opposed to saying, here's the top line and you go figure it out. Um, but obviously the United States remains a global power. The challenges we face are much different than any other country in the world because we, have, we are a global power. And uh, right now I don't see anything that gives me a great deal of comfort in uh, the national security strategy by the administration acknowledging the, the fact that we could well have to engage in a multi-front and multi-front conflict uh, or a strategy that elevates you know, the things that can kill you over things that are important like climate uh, but which are hardly as urgent as uh, the threat of let's say a invasion of Taiwan. 
So let me ask you to, to say a little bit more about that, because you mentioned the national security strategy. And, and so uh, in the past few months, uh, the Biden administration put out its national security strategy, followed by its national defense strategy, the former really being an encapsulation of how the administration sees the world and what it's trying to achieve, the latter really meant to be uh, DOD's approach to this and to shape budget requests and, and what the department buys and what it prepares for. And so I'm curious, maybe you could say a little bit more when you look at these documents, what do you think the administration gets right in terms of looking at the international environment and the threats we face, and, and where do these documents perhaps fall short? Well, as you know, the president's budget is, um, is um, a convenient doorstop um, for the Appropriations Committee. It doesn't really have much weight, although, other than it does signal what the administration's priorities are. But as I mentioned earlier, when you think about the challenges that we face, whether they're in Europe, supplying our, our allies in Ukraine, working with our NATO allies to make sure that what happens in Ukraine doesn't spill over into the rest of Europe and invoke uh, Article 5 of uh, North Atlantic Treaty, um, where we would be obligated by law to come to their, to their aid. But you look at North Korea, you look at uh, uh, Iran, uh, obviously, we have a lot of challenges uh, to face, and I, I don't see a particular plan in place that, uh, again, uh, looks at um, what resources we need and uh, how we are actually going to fight those, uh, those fights. I'm reminded by something that General MacArthur said, that the, uh, the most common two words or the, the two words that describe our failure in uh, military conflict are too late. You've made the same point in uh, speaking of serial amnesiacs, I believe in one of That's your right. books. And, uh, or you could, uh, I guess, refer to Winston Churchill who said that one thing for certain is that mankind is unteachable. Uh, we just don't seem to have the sense of urgency or commitment, uh, I think, that's commensurate with the threats we face today. And that, that quote from General MacArthur, I believe, came during the, the U.S. preparedness debate on the run-up to World War II. I think he said it in, in 1940. And, of course, it turned out that the United States was, was too late in many yeah. respects in terms of preparing for that, that war. And so I think it's a sobering reminder of, of some of the historical parallels. One of the, the challenges that sort of resonates with respect to that period, which I think you alluded to, is that the United States now faces great power rivals on, on both sides of Eurasia simultaneously. Mm -hmm. and, and we've seen really repeatedly over the past year and a half how it's, it's not at all wild to suggest that you could have conflicts break out in Eastern Europe and in the Western Pacific at the same time. And so um, at the end of 2021, there were heightened tensions in both areas. In the summer of 22, we had a raging war in Ukraine that, as you mentioned, threatened to implicate some of our alliance commitments at the same time that we had the worst military crisis in the Taiwan Strait in a quarter century um, following uh, then Speaker Pelosi's visit uh, to the island. And so I'm, I'm curious, do you sometimes hear it argued that the United States simply lacks the ability or lacks the wherewithal to be able to compete in both of these theaters simultaneously, to deter challenges to the status quo in both places? simultaneously. Is that, is that true? Is that not true? And how should we think about that particular challenge? Well, I don't believe that's true. Um, the question is, do we lack the will to rise to the challenge? But we have something that, uh, that our potential adversaries in the PRC um, uh, do not have. Um, one of my colleagues, we have this tradition in the Senate, when people come to the Senate, they give their maiden speech and one of my colleagues, who will remain nameless, but said something that seems so obvious and so true at the same time that it's just kind of stuck with me. He said, the one thing we have that China does not have is friends. It is perhaps our greatest asset, our greatest strength, is our friends and our allies around the world. I, I was... Re uh, again, uh, reviewing something you'd written before, pointed out if you look at all of the various democracies in the world, people who are like-minded to the United States, we represent 60% of the world GDP and military spending. Um, but I have to say, you know, my this idea that if there were to be, let's say, an, a, an invasion of Taiwan, that all of a sudden 
our friends would come running was uh, my, I was disabused of that a little bit when on a recent trip that Senator Warner, chairman of the Intelligence Committee, and Senator King, who's a, like me, or a member of the Intelligence Committee, made to Australia and to uh, uh, New Zealand. I did not get the sense that um, they were eager um, to, uh, to uh, come to the defense of Taiwan were to be invaded. That's not to say they wouldn't. Uh, obviously, they're concerned with the formation of the Quad and AUKUS, um, Australia, US, and UK, those, those um, partnerships. But that's a far cry from actually committing um, troops and committing resources to, uh, to re repel uh, a, an invasion of Taiwan. And then about a year ago, I was in uh, Delhi uh, visiting with Prime Minister Modi with some of my colleagues. And clearly, uh, India has been um, uh, a bit of a disappointment in terms of their failure to join the resolution condemning the Ukraine invasion. And obviously, they continue to be pretty dependent on Russia in terms of their military weaponry. So um, my only point is, we may have this idea that we've got a lot of friends and they would come running if we needed their help. Um, I'm not sure that that's exactly true, but one thing I'm absolutely positive of, none of this would happen without American leadership. Well, let me, let me push you on that a little bit because I think there is, you know, regardless of who you ask in Washington or in the academic community, there's agreement that the United States needs to push allies to do more in helping us meet the various security threats that, that we collectively face, just in part because there are so many of them, and so our resources will be more stretched in, in dealing with them. But then you get into a debate over what is the best way to do that. Right. And, and you will sometimes let's say there's kind of two theories of the case of this, and, and one that's um, popular among some of my academic uh, restraint-oriented friends is that you say we're going to we're going to take our hand off the bicycle, right? You're going to be we're going to leave you to do it, Europe, and and you take care of your security problems so we can focus on the Western Pacific. And then I think sort of the more traditional answer from Washington has been, no, the way you do it is by showing them that you're there, you're committed, you're putting your own skin in the game, and so on and so forth. And so you've had a couple of decades at looking at this, and so I'm curious what your experiences uh, incline you to think in terms of that debate. Well, there's no perfect answer. Um, obviously, if, um, if our friends and allies are living under the umbrella of United States protection, why in the world would they spend money uh, on their own defense if they think they can depend on the United States? So that's not entirely satisfactory, uh, not satisfactory at all. Meanwhile, they continue to develop their domestic economy and and so forth. Um, but I think what we're seeing right now is a recognition, particularly by countries like Japan, that this threat implicates them directly and they need to step up their game. And I think that's been a, a, a very encouraging sign. Uh, Ambassador Rahm Emanuel, mm -hmm. a guy I, who I'm sort of in different political worlds from, I think has done a very good job as uh, the US ambassador in Japan He's kind of a no-nonsense kind of guy, and I think that's what we need in that position to encourage the Japanese to continue to come along as they did, starting with Prime Minister Abe, uh, with the current administration, and uh, build their defense capability and be able to work more cooperatively with us. Conversely, you know, you look at look at NATO. President Trump had his own approach uh, to trying to get our NATO allies to step up to their two percent requirement. That was that was pretty, um, uh, um, that was a little bumpy um, along the way. But then you have uh, countries like Germany, who are a NATO ally, who are now beginning to balk at uh, what they, what seemed to be an encouraging sign, at least at the beginning of, of the invasion of Ukraine, that they were going to be a full partner in the efforts to repel uh, Russia and, and, uh, and defending NATO. So. Um, I don't think there's any perfect, uh, perfect answer. Obviously, we can't force these countries to do uh, what we want them to do, but we can encourage them uh, and, I think, point out the obvious, which is their own exposure. Um, and, uh, and countries like Japan and J Australia, which we have seen them uh, really, really step up pretty significantly. 
And so since you mentioned Ukraine, maybe we'll, we'll talk about that for a second. Um, and you were referencing you know, some of the recent debates in Germany about, one, how quickly they will get to the 2% threshold on defense spending, but then also on the question of basically allowing the re-export of leopard tanks from countries mm -hmm. like Poland to Ukraine. I'm, I'm curious to get your take on those specific issues, but maybe we could start with a broader question about Ukraine. You, you've been a leading proponent of US support for Ukraine. And so we're almost, we're coming up on the one year mark of the most recent phase of right. the conflict. Of course, it's worth reminding people that from Ukraine's perspective, this war has been going on for, for nearly nine years uh, at, this, at this point. But looking at the most recent round of the fighting since February uh, 2022, one year in, where do things stand? And where do you expect that the war might go over the coming months? Well, um, we've all wondered what Putin must have been thinking. My own theory is part of what he was thinking is that he saw the Taliban march into Kabul uh, without a shot being fired and took over the country and may have thought, hey, I can do that in Ukraine. Thank goodness the Ukrainians have demonstrated an incredible will to fight and resist. And uh, President Zelensky is, has been a heroic figure uh, and somebody who's inspired not only his own countrymen and, and women, but also the rest of the world to come to the aid of Ukraine. Some of my friends in Congress uh, question our expenditure of uh, vast sums of money, which are significant, uh, to help Ukraine. Uh, my own view is that that is money well spent, uh, degrading Russia's ability uh, to do what it did in Ukraine any much in the further. And my firm conviction is if somehow there were peace were to break out today, they would just reset and mm. regroup and rearm and continue their ideological restoration of the Russian empire, or at least the USSR, because that's an ideological uh, goal of uh, Putin and uh, some of his fellow Russians and not it's not a cost benefit analysis uh, from what their standpoint. So I think, you know, while it's certainly important for us to make sure that American tax dollars are always well spent and that our allies are in the fight and providing the resources and bearing their fair share, uh, particularly given the proximity of the fight to where they live, um, I think this is uh, something that uh, we have to do. And uh, one of, my, one of my colleagues referred to uh, Zelensky as uh, Winston Churchill in a T-shirt. Uh, he's, as I said, been an inspiring leader and uh, somebody who I think has surprised a lot of folks, including me, with his ability to not only inspire his people, but to uh, rally the rest of the free world in support of Ukraine. And what about U.S. policy there? And in terms of enabling Ukraine and supporting Ukraine, is the United States doing the right amount? Is it not doing enough? Is it doing too little with respect to whether it's specific capabilities or just kind of the general level of, of aid and support? Or are we on track to enable Ukraine to achieve what we ought to want them to be able to achieve? Well, I think it's been too slow, but eventually, um, you remember early on when there was some discussion about providing MiGs mm -hmm. from Poland and elsewhere to Ukraine, the Defense Department and the Biden administration said that that was escalatory. Of course, the big, the, 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 what, what Putin has, and we all know he has tactical nuclear weapons, and he rattles that saber from time to time. So far, there's no indication he's inclined to use it, at least, uh, at least for the time being. But we do know that according to public published doctrine of the, of the, of the Russians, that if it were an existential threat to the regime or to the country, that they would use those tactical nuclear weapons, which of course would be a terrible mistake and would be devastating. So that's been that's been the uh, what I think has caused uh, the administration to tap the brakes, perhaps more than I would like. But they seem to have come along. We didn't know whether this would be over in a matter of days or in a matter of years, and um, I'm. I think uh, particularly with the provision of the HIMARS and uh, other advanced weaponry um, that uh, the Ukrainians are doing, doing a, an amazing, amazing job. The question then becomes, um, 
and I know we'll get to this, but how do we replenish uh, all of those munitions and all those weapons that, um, that the United States and, and our allies in NATO are providing to the Ukrainians? I do, I do want to get there. Um, I want to ask you one more specific question about Ukraine, though, and it has to do with war aims, basically. So the Ukrainians have been very clear about what they seek in this conflict, mm -hmm. and their aims are imminently understandable, which is they want every square inch of their territory back, and they want reparations and, and so on and, and so forth. Uh, what should U.S. war aims in the conflict be? Do we need to help the Ukrainians liberate all of the territory, including Crimea? Could we be satisfied with something short of that? I, I imagine those, those debates are going to become more heated as the year yeah. goes on. Well, as you know, the United States has a history of uh, the longer these things go on, the American people become distracted, fatigued by this and, and look at the endless expenditure of funds and say, you know, this has got to come to an end. Uh, I'm not smart enough to know how it comes to an end. I do remember General Petraeus, when he was head of Central Command years ago when I was on the Armed Services Committee, he said the most important question to ask in any conflict is how does this end? And I don't think we know how it ends. For Putin, I think he's, he's ready to grind the Ukrainians in submission as long as he can. He's ready to outlast of the West in terms of our support and commitment to helping the Ukrainians. Um, and I'm not sure we know how it ends. I do not believe that it's, a, that it's our job to tell the Ukrainians, you must take this deal. You've got to cut this deal or else we'll pull the plug in our support. I do not think that's appropriate. I think that's something we ought to have. We ought to, uh, the Ukrainians need to take the lead on. Well, you brought up the defense industrial base piece of this question, so maybe we should go there now. One of the reasons why the tank debate has become so prominent is that Ukraine and the countries supporting Ukraine are running short of artillery rounds right. that are needed in the conflict. And so as inspiring as Ukrainian resistance has been and, and Western support for Ukraine uh, have been, it also seems to have revealed some real shortcomings in the ability of Western countries, including the United States, to sustain protracted conflicts that consume the amount of munitions and platforms that, that modern war does. And so I'm curious for your evaluation of that issue, and then if the, the problem statement is essentially right, what do we do about it, given the fact that this is not the last contingency we are likely to face? Well, um, according to um, CSIS, the... Um, 155 millimeter ammunition standard artillery round um, will take about five years to replenish based on uh, the number transferred to Ukraine and a production rate of a roughly 93,000 a year. That's just one example. Then, you know, obviously the javelins and the, and, the, uh, and the stingers, which became famous at the early stages of the war because of their ability to take out uh, uh, Russian armor um, sort of the same story. Um, this gets back to our appropriation and spending levels and our preparation for conflict in more than just one place in the world. And clearly we're not ready. Clearly our industrial base is not engaged. Um, I think they're waiting for uh, demand signals, um, primarily prompted by appropriations by Congress and by uh, multi-year contracting uh, so they can make the investment, which is substantial, uh, to begin to produce these weapons and replenish what we and our allies um, have given Ukraine based on uh, based on their current need. But this this ought to be a this ought to be a flashing red light uh, for us. And uh, it's shocking to me. I was visiting with a a friend of mine who's former uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense, but we read this in the, I read this in the Wall Street Journal a while back and how difficult it was to, and how many years it was going to take to replenish these arms. And he said he was just absolutely shocked. Yeah. And I said, well, I'm glad to hear that because I was shocked, but I wondered whether I was maybe missing something. But this is a, this is a huge gearing, a glaring problem. And, um, Right now, I don't see the sort of uh, all hands on deck commitment to try to address that. And if, as, as we discussed earlier, if, if we were to 
have conflicts in places like Asia or elsewhere, uh, clearly we, we would be unprepared. And so, Senator, why, why is that? I mean, is it, is it because um, the U.S. no longer has the same type of economy it did during World War II? Is it because there's been so much consolidation within the defense industry over the past 30 years? Is it because we've you know, optimized procurement and acquisitions for kind of a peacetime environment rather than a wartime environment? Why, why do we find ourselves in a place where we seem to have so much trouble producing the things that our military needs? Well, I think because we try to repeatedly cash the peace dividend when there is no peace. And um, the preparation for keeping the peace, which is mainly based on deterrence, takes a substantial commitment, which when in times of peace, um, elected members of Congress and others sort of say, well, we're doing okay, so we're, we're muddling right along. But we saw in, with the invasion of Ukraine, what some have called a, um, our holiday from history was over. And um, we were not prepared. Um, I, just, I remember talking to a guy, I'm getting a haircut in Austin, Texas, and the guy told me, he was maybe 30-ish year old, he said, I, I, thought, I thought that was all part of our history. I didn't know this could happen to us again. And we have been so successful uh, deterring um, being the you know sort of unipolar power for so long until now we find ourselves uh, in great power competition again. We just simply haven't risen to the challenge, I believe, or had the sense of urgency uh, that it requires. And um, I think that's got to change because I do believe Ronald Reagan was right when he talked about uh, uh, peace through deterrence. Uh, and right now, I don't know whether President Xi is appropriately deterred. Certainly after watching the free world come to the aid of Ukraine, he's got to wonder you know, about uh, invading Taiwan. But as you know, that's one of their, their primary, um, primary, primary aspects or aspirations of their foreign policy, reunification with Taiwan. And uh, what that would mean is, uh, would, is pretty frightening. And uh, at the same time, um, to me, it's obvious we're not ready. Yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned Taiwan because that's, that's the obvious next place to go. And so maybe we could start by asking, in, in your view, what are the lessons that the Taiwanese and uh, their friends uh, in the world ought to be learning from the Ukraine war? Does, it, does Ukraine illustrate things that Taiwan can do to better prepare itself? Does it illustrate things that countries that might support Taiwan can better do to prepare themselves for a conflict? Well, I think the first lesson is one guy can get out of bed one morning and decide we're going to invade. One guy, Putin in Russia, President Xi in the PRC. So there's a lot of speculation about, well, they're going to wait till 2027. They're going to, you know, they're not ready yet. Um, and of course, a lot of attention paid to some of the war games that have been played out uh, with, a, with a Taiwan invasion scenario. Um, I don't think the, the Taiwanese are ready. Um, we are trying to help them, but um, it, you know, and Taiwan is also not Ukraine. It's not, uh, it's not land bound, it's, a, it's an island uh, which is vulnerable to invasion from the, from the sea. And uh, China continues to be more and more belligerent, um, threatening freedom of navigation in the South China Sea and elsewhere. So um, I think we're seeing all the signs that, uh, that President Xi is serious. And I think the only thing that will stop him is if he judges the cost to be higher than the value of uh, unifying with Taiwan. And uh, that, uh, that ought to get everybody's attention. I think it's it's very and it's an apt point to make in the sense that uh, the strategy that the United States and other Western countries have used to support Ukraine probably won't work in Taiwan right. in the sense that if you wait for the fighting to start and then try to flood the place with weapons and supplies to help it defend itself, the geography is just so much more challenging right. with respect well, to Taiwan. Everything I've read in public sources is the the strategy is you know hold on for a couple of weeks till the cavalry arrives. Cavalry being the United right. States and other countries. But um, that sounds okay, maybe, if you can hold out for a couple of weeks. 
And um, uh, one of the most interesting things to me uh, about that potential uh, and gives me some hope is that uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, which is the premier world um, manufacturer of advanced semiconductors, is located in, in Taipei. And any disruption in that supply would not only affect us in other countries, but also China. And so um, it's, it's, not, it's not clear, but there's enough warning signals that uh, we ought to uh, be ramping up our state of preparation. I think this goes to the heart of the issue of why it's so important to deter a conflict over Taiwan. Because one, once a war breaks out over Taiwan, the economic consequences are going to be orders of magnitude worse than what we've seen in, in Ukraine, precisely Absolutely. because Taiwan is so central to technological supply chains. Um, so you mentioned that you don't think the United States is, is ready for what may be coming in the Western Pacific. And so maybe I could ask you to expand on that a little bit and, and say what concerns you and, and whether there are particular areas of Chinese military modernization that seem particularly threatening or, or perhaps threatening to create asymmetries and weaken our ability to respond if she just were to decide to use force in the region. Well, since uh, 1990, we've seen a tenfold increase in uh, China's military spending. And like everything to do with the PRC, they're not transparent. We don't know what we don't know, but that's what we believe we know is a tenfold increase in spending. So clearly they are, um, um, they are preparing for something. Uh, we know that some of their, uh, uh, some of their work in hypersonics, mm -hmm. like the Russians, is, uh, is well in advance of ours. One of the ironies of that, uh, Hal, is I believe that the original hypersonics technology was something we developed in America, but then put on a shelf, uh, perhaps because of the cost or because we didn't think we needed it. Now we find ourselves having to play catch up with China and Russia when it comes to hypersonic uh, weapons. And uh, of course our missile defense technology, which uh, President Reagan in a Star Wars vision had, you know, it doesn't work very well when things are flying at Mach 10 or whatever, whatever the speed they go. Um, so clearly they are, uh, you know, Part, part of uh, Deng Xiaoping's uh, famous statement that they would uh, hide their capabilities and bide their time. We've been very distracted by the Middle East, of course, and we've been continuing to fund uh, China's rise because of the enormous investments that the United States has made in China. We had an open hearing in the Intelligence Committee about a year ago where one witness testified that the current market value of US investments in the PRC was roughly $2.3 trillion. So Deng Xiaoping's idea to open up China to foreign investment has worked magnificently, even though we know that uh, they don't play by the rules, they steal as much as they can in terms of uh, technology transfer, they coerce, um, coerce people who uh, wanna do business there to, uh, uh, to sh share their uh, IP. And uh, of course, they're world class when it comes to espionage and cyber theft. So um, it's pretty clear that what they're, the direction they're heading in, and, and uh, I think there has been a, a gradual awakening in the United States, and particularly in Congress, to the, to the level of the threat. Uh, but it seems like it's slow in coming. As you know, Mike Gallagher, a congressman, has been appointed in the House to chair a, a new China committee. Um, Michael McCall, who's the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee now in the House, uh, I know these are at the top of their list of concerns. Certainly in the Intelligence Committee uh, that I sit on in the Senate, uh, we've been focusing on China for, uh, for a while now. And uh, certainly we are in a race uh, to develop some of the most advanced technologies in the world, whether it's AI or quantum computing. Uh, but things which threaten uh, to undermine our ability to defend ourselves and to deter uh, them as the aggressor. So the current framework for U.S. policy toward Taiwan is, is really spelled out in the Taiwan Relations Act, right. which was passed over four decades ago. 
um, and has been translated into something that's often referred to as strategic ambiguity uh, with respect to America's position toward what it would do if, if a conflict were to break out in the Taiwan Strait. There has been more and more debate over the last two years or so whether the United States should shift to a position of strategic clarity and mm -hmm. sort of issuing something closer to an alliance-like guarantee that it would come to Taiwan's aid if it were attacked. Do, do you have a view on, on which of these policies makes the most sense, or is it beside the point because it's primarily a capabilities problem rather than a clarity of commitment problem? I think it's a moot point. Uh, I think the President Xi and the PRC assume that the United States would come to the aid of Taiwan. Uh, Japan clearly believes that an attack on Taiwan would threaten their national security interests, particularly given the nature of the disputed islands uh, in, uh, in the South China Sea. Um, again, I'm a little less confident about what some of our other friends might do, um, and so I don't think we should assume that the cavalry would arrive in mass, but I do think that it's uh, our national security interest, not, and not to mention our economic interest, would be dramatically influenced for the negative if, uh, if we let them uh, succeed. So I want to shift a little bit um, to thinking about how the United States does business and how DOD does business. And so we've talked particularly about policy issues so far, but as you noted at the outset, your policy is really dependent on what you can ultimately pay for and what you can fund and how you use that money. And so um, when we were talking before we came on, uh, you mentioned that you had seen former Secretary of Defense uh, Bob Gates mm -hmm. uh, a few months ago. Um, and he's often talked about the challenges that not having predictable, reliable funding creates for DOD. And so do you share that concern? Uh, and if so, what ought we to do about it? I asked him point blank. I said, what are the top three things that we need to do? And he said, first, no s continuing resolutions, no sequestration. Um, that kind of surprised me a little bit. But obviously, it's hard to plan um, operating on a continuing resolution. This most recent controversial omnibus, as you know, mm -hmm. plussed up the, the administration's uh, appropriation request for the Department of Defense by $45 billion. So clearly, there's a bipartisan consensus in Congress that the administration is not, at least in its budget request, acknowledging the nature of the threats or the needs uh, that we have. Um, but at the same time, now we have a divided Congress and, and White House, and uh, I think it's going to be a real heavy lift to get back to what I would call regular order on the appropriations process. The, the terrible thing about an omnibus appropriation bill is there are basically four people who decide what that top line is, and they decide who the winners and losers are, and then rank and file members of Congress get to vote yes or no, and uh, that's it. It's a, it's, I, I think it, it treats, we, we, what we saw this last year in treating the National Defense Authorization Bill, which would been, which had passed, I believe, 61 years in a row, sort of as an afterthought, and then the, uh, the appropriations for uh, national security and others sort of kicked up until December the 23rd, I thought was embarrassing and really, I think, is indicative of, of how people view these really, really, really important matters, which are uh, how do we fund and how do we prepare for the various threats we, we face. And continuing resolutions and sequestration, as Secretary Gates said, is, uh, is one of the first places you would not want to go. And it seems like that's where we end up going. And is there a reputational cost to that as well? Does it make us seem less serious about the way that we're confronting challenges, whether viewed from allies or adversaries? Well, you know our, our adversaries around the world are constantly touting the superiority of their system over ours, whether it's the PRC or the Russian Federation, that we don't have all these problems that the Americans have. Well, some of that's called democracy and um, you know pluralism, and uh, not everybody thinks alike. And uh, but we work our work our differences out, um, and uh, so yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that our adversaries are are uh, uh, touting that as a reason why the United States is not as dependable as uh, as 
as, um, as, as we should be. One of the points you've made in thinking about um, how DOD spends money is that it's, it's not just the top line that matters. It's not just the amount of money. It's what the money is, is spent on. Absolutely. And so are there areas that need to be more emphasized in what DOD is buying and preparing for? Are there areas that need to be less emphasized in what DOD is buying and preparing for? Well, of course, the acquisition and procurement process is notoriously bureaucratic and slow. Um, thinking about the advantages that, uh, that, that China has, if we can you know, develop an F-35 joint strike fighter after hundreds of billions of dollars of investment and, um, and then they can just steal it, uh, well, that's pretty good, pretty good savings. Um, and so obviously that's, that's a huge problem. But if you think about, uh, we talked about the semiconductors and uh, technology. Uh, this is an area where we have a clear advantage, but we are still too dependent on uh, countries like Taiwan, basically because Taiwan Semiconductor decided their business model would be not to design chips, but to manufacture chips made by other companies. And it's been a fabulously successful model, but unfortunately it's concentrated that technology in one, one place in Asia, uh, whether it's in South Korea with Samsung or TSMC, in Taiwan, but clearly we're in an arm techno technological arms race. Um, you know, 5G, much touted, but maybe not quite as uh, significant, although everybody now understands that, for example, Huawei, uh, which was the leading, uh, leading provider, wanted to be the leading provider in 5G, um, that how that would be exploited by uh, the PRC, uh, basically, have a back door to download or spy on or collect data uh, from uh, unwitting uh, users of that technology. But now, of course, AI, which has taken on greater prominence, um, obviously uh, things like quantum computing, which threatens virtually all of our encryption um, that we use to secure secret stuff. Um, these are all areas where I think we're gonna continue to be in a technological arms race. But the one thing that it occurs to me that the United States has that the PRC doesn't have is the ability to uh, encourage the private sector and to take advantage of the incredible entrepreneurs and innovators and creators. One of the reasons I was encouraged when the Army, for example, created Army Futures Command in Austin, Texas, is to work with the private sector to take advantage of, uh, of what they are able to produce and um, great ideas they can come up with to partner with them. The Department of Defense says the Defense Innovation Unit, which uh, purports to do the same sorts of things. Um, I'm not, I, I don't know whether there's, whether we could do more, but certainly that's the right direction to be heading in uh, because uh, right now the, uh, the you know, we, uh, the, the, way we, the way we purchase and produce these weapon systems takes way too long and, uh, and it's way too expensive and we need to find ways to compete where we know we can win and that is to out innovate and outrun our opposition when it comes to technology. All right, I wanna save time to give the audience a chance to ask questions, so I'll go to that in just a second, but just one, one last one for you before we open it up. Um, there has been reporting in, in recent weeks uh, coming out of the negotiations that led to now Speaker McCarthy uh, uh, gaining that position about the potential for capping uh, defense spending at FY22 levels. And so you mentioned that there had been a bipartisan consensus in Congress that administration budget requests for DOD were, were insufficient. Are you fairly confident that that consensus will remain as we go forward? I think it's going to be a hard fought. Um, we are about thirty trillion dollars in debt. Uh, about five trillion of that, I think, was added during on a bipartisan basis during the COVID pandemic. We'd, we'd never seen anything quite like that before in the, the United States. It was sort of like a domestic version of World War III. I don't think we could really stop and question, you know, should we develop a vaccine? Should we develop these public health measures? Should we save our economy so that when we come out of the backside that we can actually uh, carry on um, 
as we did before. So some of that spending was, uh, was necessary and was bipartisan, but obviously there's a lot of concern with the high level of our, uh, of our public debt. And uh, what it means is that if we have another uh, pandemic, if we have another uh, financial crisis like we had in 2008, um, interest rates are now high because of inflation. We have a lot less flexibility in dealing with those than we would if we had a more reasonable debt to GDP um, ratio. So I don't discount any of that at all. So there's gonna be a, a lot of hard fought debate about that, but I would say the days, the days of uh, spending uh, all this money like we did in uh, the last two years on uh, American Rescue Plan or the Inflation uh, Reduction Act or what I call the Inflation Non-Reduction Act, um, those days are over. All right, well, why don't, why don't we open it up? If you raise your hand, I'll call on you and we will uh, find you at the microphone. So why don't we start just over here on the side and I would just ask you to briefly uh, identify yourself, ask a, a relatively concise question, and make sure that it's a question, in fact. Sounds good. My name is John. Thank you for your time today speaking. I was curious, you talked about incentivizing private, private sector innovation in the U.S. Uh, to compete with China. To what extent should we be discouraging private equity money in, in mainland China? Well, I don't think we're at the point of discouraging it per se. Uh, Senator Bob Casey of Pennsylvania and I have a a bill uh, which would provide some transparency to outbound investments into China. Um, I think that's important just to know sort of what's happening. Uh, we know that there's already adjustments being made because of concerns about vulnerable supply chains, uh, companies uh, re 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 reestablishing themselves, for example, in Vietnam and elsewhere, maybe even perhaps in Mexico, I think that was part of the discussions that the administration had more recently, where previously we'd seen a lot of that manufacturing go from Mexico to China, and now it seems like it's now leaving China to some extent for organic reasons or because of risk, uh, perception of, of, of risk. Um, but um, I think um, we're going to continue to see um, concerns about the China because ever since the, they became part of the World Trade Organization, the hope had been, uh, maybe the triumph of hope over experience, uh, that they would become part of the rule, international rules-based order, and clearly they did not. As I mentioned earlier, they are world-class when it comes to stealing intellectual property, coercing through joint ventures and other sort of uh, arrangements, um, uh, sharing of not only IP, but know-how, uh, foreign investments in the United States that are supposed to be policed by the CFIUS process, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, um, and then, of course, cyber uh, espionage. So I think we're pretty clear-eyed about wh who they are and what they're doing, and we just need to, we need to act accordingly. And I think we're gradually... Uh, getting in a better place. Now let's go uh, over there, please, to the, the woman in the back. Thank you so much. My name is Katerina, Voice of America, Ukrainian Service. Right now, in terms of uh, Russian war in Ukraine, the biggest conversation is providing tanks to Ukraine. And apparently Germany is hesitating to provide tanks because they're waiting for allies to break the ice. Do you think United States should provide tanks to Ukraine? And uh, why United States may hesitate to not do it? Well, my, my former colleague, Ben Sass, who now has left the Senate to go to the University of Florida, uh, early on in the conflict, um, said, if it shoots, ship it. I kind of like that. In other words, I don't know why we would withhold any capacity uh, that may be available um, to Ukraine to repel the invasion or to defend their country short of any concerns about, obviously, uh, Putin uh, using tactical nuclear weapons. And of course, he's more than happy to rattle that saber, but again, we kind of have some ideas about uh, what their doctrine is in, in that regard. 
But again, you know, nobody really thought that Putin would do what he did on February the 24th of last year. Um, and one person just made that decision. So I think, I hope the Germans can find their way to, uh, uh, to stepping up uh, to support uh, the Ukrainians more aggressively. And I would wonder, you know, what does that mean in terms of their commitment to the NATO alliance if, in fact, heaven forbid, um, NATO were threatened? Um, can we depend on them? And uh, I think uh, that raises a number of questions. Yes, in the gray sweater. Hi, my name's Jeff. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned that um, you don't think uh, she, she could just wake up one day and decide to invade uh, Taiwan. I was being a little facetious. Sure. About, no, I understand. I understand. One, one man makes that decision. Absolutely. But given that it is the concentration of power in that one person, um, do you think we have enough insight as to how that one person operates uh, from the intelligence perspective? And do you think the U.S. understands enough about China, given that in the same situation, uh, Mr. Putin, a lot of countries believe that Mr. Putin would have that same calculation and decide not to go into Ukraine, but he did. Uh, so since we got that, sorry, the U.S. didn't get that wrong. But uh, do you think that we might potentially get that wrong for China? Well, our intelligence community is good, but we're not that good. We're not a mind reader. And I think, obviously, President Xi is um, presiding of a country of more than a billion people. Um, we don't have perfect insight. We do have some insight into his thinking and, and uh, what they say publicly, certainly. Um, but <coughs> one of the concerns is that um, this is the number one item on their list in terms of foreign policy, and uh, I think we ought to take them seriously. It's maybe worth noting, and you know, one of the, the good news stories of the Ukraine war has been just how much and how remarkable the advance warning the U.S. intelligence community was able right. to provide. The, the downside to that is that it could, in theory, create unrealistic expectations for what might be possible in other contexts right. in, in the future. Uh, and, and so it's worth you know, patting the IC on the back for what they were able to do in, in this they, case. But it's, a, it's an incredibly, incredibly high Ukraine. bar to, to meet. Uh, let's see. Right, right in the center here, the gentleman with the, the mask. <clears throat> good afternoon. My name is Eric Lechica with the U.S. Filipinos for Good Governance. Um, I think to top uh, Biden uh, security uh, uh, officials, Kreitenberg uh, and uh, uh, DND Secretary uh, Ford were in the Philippines this last week and they uh, negotiated assurances from the new Philippine uh, government of expanding the number of joint bases for U.S. forces from five to ten. Do you think that's uh, encouraging uh, uh, developments? to ensure uh, the free Indo-Pacific uh, area? I do think that's encouraging. I know, um, obviously, with the transition to the new leadership in the Philippines, um, there'd been, it wasn't entirely clear what direction that would go in. Um, but I was there last summer and uh, flew on a, out of Manila in a P-8, which is a big old airplane that they then took down to 300 feet off of the uh, South China Sea off of the surface, and one of the ships we were tracking, they were tracking, I wasn't tracking, uh, was a Chinese signals intelligence ship right there in the, in the South China Sea. So uh, this is, uh, I think the Philippines are, are smart to realize that this is a threat to their sovereignty and their independence, and I'm glad to see uh, uh, the enhanced uh, cooperation and partnership between the United States and the Philippines, not for our benefit necessarily, but for their own benefit or for our mutual benefit. Uh, the main reason we're there, of course, is to try to deter, uh, deter uh, the PRC. Um, but I think that's, uh, that sounds like an encouraging development. I think we had a question from the lady just next to the gentleman who asked the last question as well. Hi, I'm Terry, and I produce uh, in the media. Um, the other day, there was an uh, article in the Wall Street Journal entitled, China's Global Mega Projects Are Falling Apart. 
And the sense of it is that the, these projects are collapsing uh, around the world with regard to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and, quote, they're falling apart bit by bit, flaws in Chinese built dams, power plants, housings, and schools risk crippling key infrastructure and saddling developing nations with more debt. All right. My question is, what does that tell us or tell our uh, investment uh, intelligence community about more of the complexion of China's strength? And how much weight should we put, Senator, on an article like that as we try to assess uh, how powerful China is? Well, the Belt and Roads Initiative is sometimes called a debt trap for the very reasons that you mentioned. They uh, come in bearing gifts uh, to help build infrastructure that uh, then does not uh, perform uh, as expected, or maybe the, uh, the host country can no longer afford to service the debt, and they default. And what that means then is China has a, maybe a, a permanent foothold in that country by virtue of their taking possession of this uh, collateral, as you will, if you will. So um, this, is, this is a matter of continuing con concern. Um, and since I come from Texas, we pay a lot of attention to what happens south of us, not only in Mexico, Central America, and South America. And not only have we seen kind of a leftward lurch uh, of the governments in South America, but also increasing openness uh, to things like Chinese uh, investments, and uh, it concerns me quite a bit that this is happening, of course, in our own hemisphere. So I think it's uh, this debt trap has now, I think, been properly identified for what it is, uh, but this is a way for China to gain influence in uh, disparate parts of the world. We thought, you know, for a while that it was just about uh, wanting to develop, um, you know, access to resources, natural resources and the like, since they import, for example, so much of their energy um, into, uh, into, their, into the country, and they need access to those resources. But uh, this is a, a cautionary tale, I think, for a lot of those countries that have been open to Chinese investment only to find themselves then losing control of, their, of, the, of these assets and uh, in favor of a more or less permanent Chinese occupation. So, Senator, we've, we've talked a lot about Russia, China, and reforming DOD, but I want to end on a hard one uh, here. So we got an online question. Uh, in light of the increased threat by North Korea, there's a growing call in South Korea on the government to develop its own nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Even the South Korean president recently said that South Korea could have its own nuclear program. What are your thoughts on this and what the United States might do to address this challenge? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a hard one. You're right. Uh, so obviously, none of this is lost on Japan and, um, and uh, South Korea. Uh, I mean, going to the DMZ, as I've done, and you've probably done and right there in, in, uh, in uh, dividing South and North Korea, um, I'm, my, my very strong impression is there is a lot of firepower lined up there along the DMZ that if, if, uh, if shots were fired, it would be devastating uh, for South Korea. And uh, I remember Secretary Rumsfeld had that map at nighttime mm -hmm. of the Korean Peninsula where South Korea was lit up like a Christmas tree, being a vibrant economy and democracy, and then there was like a pinpoint of light in North Korea. So this is a very volatile situation. Uh, Kim Jong-un clearly believes that possessing a, uh, uh, a nuclear capability protects, his, protects him and his regime, which uh, is the number one concern of these autocrats, these dictators, is regime survival. Um, but that's a, that's a very uh, a difficult question that I don't have an answer to at the top of, my, at the top of my head. But I do know that, there, uh, that these countries do, uh, they, they look to the United States. And again, I mentioned part of why we need them to step up and contribute more to their own defense because they're used to living under America's protective umbrella. And um, that is very costly and something that uh, we ought to insist that they do more to uh, pull their own weight.
All right. Well, I imagine we could talk about this issue or any of those that we've raised for, for some time, but I'm afraid we've come to the top of the hour. So, Senator, thank you for, for Thanks, joining Senator. us. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you.